So, dear participants, good afternoon, one and, one and all. It's with great pleasure and anticipation that we extend a warm welcome to Mr. Manantaran, the esteemed CEO of Silico Color Quantum, as a distinguished resource person for our short term training program on quantum computing and quantum machine learning. Mr. Manan is not just a quantum computing entrepreneur, he is a visionary who, who is deeply passionate about the transformative potential of quantum computing and its ability to reshape our world. His commitment to tuning this vision into reality is evident in the foundation of Silico Color Quantum, a venture that reflects his dedication to advancing quantum computing technology. With a solid background in electronics engineering from the Vellur Institute of Technology, Vellur, and an IBM certified Qiskit developer, Mr. Manan, bring a wealth of technical expertise to the field. His experience as an engineer, coupled with a proven track record position, him as a leader in the quantum computing landscape. As the CEO of Silicon Flare Quantum, Mr. Manan has played a pivotal role in the development of quantum computing chips and superconducting quantum circuits showcasing his dedication to building scalable quantum computing solution his passion for the field extends beyond the technical realm as he actively advocates for the growth of quantum computing in india aiming to establish the country as a leading hub for research and development in this revolutionary field mr manan's belief in the power of collaboration is reflected in his instrumental role in building the quantum computing community at Dell Technologies. He is not only an expert in his field, but also a compelling communicator, regularly, regularly sharing his insights and experiences at quantum computing events. As we embark on the lightning, enlightening journey into the realm of quantum computing and quantum machine learning, we are honored to have Mr. Manantaran guide us with the, his profound knowledge and experiences. We look forward to encouraging and engaging and insightful session under his leadership. Please join us, extending a warm welcome to Mr. Manantaram. Now I request Mr. Manantaram to take over the session and continue the presentation. Please, sir. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, Christopher, sir. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for hosting me and uh, for giving me this opportunity. So I'll start by uh, giving you some brief introduction about quantum computing since we have very limited time around uh, one and a half hour to cover the session so i'll quickly go through all the slides that i've prepared so far and by the end of the session i'll be open for questions so we can take up the questions that we have so with that i would like to begin and uh, firstly i would also give you a, a brief intro about myself so as sir mentioned that i've been graduated from vit below so it's been uh, a very fruitful journey for me uh, with uh, graduating from VIT Vellore and then working at Dell Technologies and then starting uh, Silico Fellow Quantum with the sole aim of making India a quantum superpower. So thank you so much. So with that, I'll give you some uh, a, a brief motivation about what we'll be going through this masterclass. So we'll focus on practical aspects of the quantum algorithms and we'll try to eliminate as much physics as possible and provide a high level quantum computing uh, overview, which is platform agnostic, which means it doesn't matter if you're using Qiskit or if you're using Q sharp or Sir. So I'll try to be as agnostic as possible so that you can understand the, uh, the main concepts behind quantum computing. And the key takeaways from this would be to build quantum literacy and so that you can go back and discuss quantum computing and you can continue learning it from where we left off. Also, we'll dive into quantum programming where we will begin developing your own quantum algorithm. So that is what uh, by the end of this uh, masterclass you'll be able to learn. A high level syllabus of what we are going to cover in the coming slides is the fundamental concepts of quantum computing, the basic algorithms, quantum subroutines, advanced algorithms and applications, and how to build quantum hardware. So as I said, we won't be able to dive much deeper into it, but we'll try to cover as many topics as possible. So these are the syllabus that we are going to cover. 
So in terms of the fundamental concepts of quantum computing, we'll go into qubits, superposition, entanglement, measurement. In simple algorithms, we'll try to cover teleportation, super dense coding, Deutsch and deutsch josa algorithms, quantum oracles, Grover search algorithms, quantum Fourier transform, and subroutines. So these are the syllabus for the advanced topics, which we are going to cover in part two, where we'll focus on quantum arithmetic, Shor's factoring algorithm, quantum error correction and fault tolerance, building a full stack quantum computer, quantum simulation, quantum chemistry, and quantum inspired algorithms. This is the reading material that I would suggest you all to go through it. These are the books. Quantum Computing for Quantum Scientists by Yonofsky and Manuki, Quantum Computation and Quantum Information by Nielsen and Chuang. So this is one of the best books out there and I would recommend everybody to go through it. Quantum Computer Science by Merman. And then we also have a few additional resources that are available on the link. These are the programming tools that we'll be using. So if you can mark those down, this is the IBM Quantum Information and Science Kit, which is also called KISS Kit. Uh, there's a whole textbook repository out there through which you can start learning quantum computing. Then we'll also give you the access to IBM Quantum Computers through the IBM Quantum Lab. And this is the link for the IBM Quantum Lab. So now comes a very important question, why quantum computing? So with that, I would like to first tell you more about classical computing and its limitations. Every person has their own limitation, whether you're calculating in your mind or you're calculating using a calculator. And similarly, every computer has its own limitations and it cannot solve some problems that are given to them. Just like a calculator cannot solve a million uh, digit question. Right? It cannot multiply million digit by million digit. It does not have the capability to do that. So similarly, classical computers also have their own limitations and supercomputers also have their own limitations. We cannot compute problems that are NP hard. And by NP hard, I mean problems like a traveling salesman problem, which basically means that how can a salesman cover all the cities that are out there and try to sell a product by limiting the route he takes, right? So there are infinite number of possible scenarios that can happen. He can either go to Delhi first, then Mumbai, then Kolkata, or he can go to Kolkata first, then Mumbai, then Delhi. So if there are hundreds of cities, right? So the possible scenarios are two raised to the power 100, right? So how can we solve that particular problem? That is where the power of quantum computing comes in. That is where we need quantum computers to solve problems that were not possible to solve before. So this is the iconic photo of the ENIAC, one of the first electronic general purpose computers. In 1946, in the University of Pennsylvania, initially it was used to compute artillery range tables and other military uses. And it was hard to envision the degree to which computers will become integrated in all aspects of human civilization. Now, 75 years later, computers have changed the world entirely, solving the hardest problems of that time and problems that couldn't even be imagined when ENIAC was built. Is at a very similar stage right now. Visionaries have already created a model of computation and develop theories on the first few key applications that a scalable computer will be able to solve. Now, companies like Microsoft, Google, and IBM invest in building hardware to bring this vision to life. While researchers keep looking for other potential applications, and this is probably just the tip of the iceberg right now, and there's a lot of things that can be explored. Fast forward to today, this is the Summit supercomputer in Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It can perform 200 petaflops per second, which is about 200 million billion operations per second. For context, the ENIA could perform about 5,000 operations per second. 
Now that's a huge number when we compare it to 5,000 operations per second. Despite this huge increase in performance, there are still some things that we cannot calculate with even our most powerful machines, like the example I gave you before. Another example would be understanding the detailed structure of molecules. It is a key problem for many industries, ranging from medicinal drug discovery to developing new catalysts for industrial processes. The world's largest supercomputer can calculate the chemical properties of a very of a small molecule like caffeine. A slightly bigger molecule, this iron molybdenum complex quickly becomes unsolvable, right? So why? The reason is that molecules follow the rules of quantum mechanics and simulating quantum mechanics classically scales really badly with the size of the molecule. It turns out that a FEMCO structure, which is a catalyst, uh, it's really important to understand that simulating these molecules on a classical system is not going to be possible. And these are the caffeine and the FEMCO molecules that I was talking about. So simulating the caffeine molecule is a simple task, but when it comes to FEMCO molecules, uh, FEMCO molecule, the problem becomes very, very difficult. So looking at the chemistry problems in general, the scaling of the classical algorithms with the number of atoms is the gray curve, exponential. Even if we improve our classical computer, we only reach this second curve. So classical computers can simulate simpler molecules, but not the more complicated ones, right? The scaling of quantum solution is fundamentally different. Since quantum effects necessary to understand the structure of the molecules have certain affinity with the quantum effects used for computation, modeling molecules scales much nicer with quantum computing, right? So when we scale it with classical computers, this gray curve happens and we cannot scale it. But with quantum computer, we can easily scale it with the number of atoms. So that is where the birth of quantum computer happens now. And it was proposed by Richard Feynman, who is considered the father of quantum mechanics and quantum computers, sorry. So the difficulty simulating the quantum systems led to the concept of a quantum computer and Richard Feynman proposed to simulate like with like, to use quantum mechanical systems to simulate other systems that are interesting, hard to explore in the lab and impossible to simulate on a classical computer. So now can, can it solve important non-quantum problems also? So that is something that we need to think that is it only the chemistry problems that can it simulate or can it, simul can it solve non-quantum problems as well? Now comes the most historic application, which is the integer factorization, right? So here's a large 2048 bit number. You must identify the two prime numbers that were multiplied together to obtain this number. It takes 1 billion years to solve on a classical computer. Can you imagine that? Just to figure out the prime factors of these two numbers. But on a quantum computer, this would take roughly 100 seconds. Now this problem underlines the RSA crypto system, which is a mainstay of internet commerce. Every encryption that is happening right now is happening with RSA algorithm. And with the advent of quantum computing, every, every key can be broken down. Every lock can be broken. Every encryption module can be broken with the help of quantum computers who can solve the factorization problem in just 100 seconds using the Shor's algorithm. And that is why we need to understand the threat and invest heavily in cryptography. So NIST has come out with a few standards which are available right now, which people can use to migrate to post-quantum cryptography. So this is how a quantum future looks like. It can probably secure the communications. It can work in the security areas. It can work in the chemistry areas. It can work in materials, optimizations, 
and what are what else are the key application areas that have been identified for quantum computing so we just saw that the power of quantum computing to break cryptography schemes but it turns out that it can also be used to build full proof cryptographic protocols right so it can be safely formed without quantum and as Feynman suggested simulating molecules has numerous applications and we will discuss this in more detail in the second part of the course materials also behave quantum mechanically at the microscopic scale and therefore quantum computers could help design new materials better batteries room temperature superconductors to build lossless power lines etc another area of very active research is quantum optimization and quantum machine learning So with that, I'd like to end the, the very first lecture. Now we'll move to the second lecture. Just give me a minute. Perfect. So we're back now. And with that, I'd like to continue by giving a quick review to you about some of the basic concepts that are involved in the field of quantum computing. So firstly, we'll go through the real and complex number, right? So with that, I'd like to give you a brief recap of what actually complex numbers are. So we define the real part A and the imaginary part B, right? And co complex numbers allow solutions to equations that would not otherwise have a solution in real numbers. Complex number is a polynomial in I with real coefficients. Relation I square plus one is equal to zero is imposed. Complex numbers can be defined as the algebraic extension of the ordinary real numbers by an imaginary number I. Complex number can be added, subtracted, multiplied as polynomials in the variable i with i square is equal to minus 1. Complex numbers can be divided by non-zero complex numbers. Complex numbers system uh, can also be uh, give rise to the fundamental theorem of algebra, which is every con non-constant polynomial equation with complex coefficient has a complex solution. This property is the complex numbers, but not the real. Complex number extend a 1D line of real numbers to a complex plane in 2D. The picture at the right, which you can see, and the horizontal axis is real part. Vertical axis is imaginary part. A plus BI is point A comma B in complex plane. If imaginary part is zero, then naturally this can be viewed as a real number and it sits on horizontal axis of the complex plane.
So with that also, we'll go through the polar form of a complex number. The norm, which is the length or magnitude of a vector is R. This is the Euclidean norm, also called the L2 norm. L2 norm is the Euclidean distance minus square root of the inner vector with itself. Note that polar form is often nicer because the angles add or subtract when multiplying. A lot of algorithms can be expressed with minimal use of complex numbers. So this is the review of matrices and vectors of size 2. A 2 cross 2 matrix is A, uh, we can represent it as A, and the vector of length 2 as X. Now multiplying a vector by a matrix can result in this matrix. So this is the review of matrices and vectors. And another example would be multiplying N cross M matrix A, which results in this particular uh, matrix. And multiplying a vector by a matrix, if you recall, this is how we uh, multiplication. So now coming to one of the most important, fundamentally most important aspect in quantum computing, which is the qubit, right? So a qubit is a unit of computation. That's all a qubit is. So a classical bit can be represented by this, whereas a quantum bit can be represented like this. Now we will refer to an ordinary computer as a classical computer with classical computation to differentiate from a quantum computer. Think of classical bits as one of two possible states, zero or one. We can thus express each state as a column vector with the appropriate state on or off. We will see why the constraint on CI is necessary soon. Superposition is a little like analog storage rather than binary. But some features of quantum machines make it not similar. So what we are trying to do over here is that qubit can represent two states at one time, right? Which is called with, with the help of the quantum mechanical phenomena called quantum superposition. Now we are extracting these quantum mechanical phenomena like superposition and entanglement to create these machines that are so much more powerful and that in 2019, Google made a claim that whatever we can do with classical computers in 10,000 years, with quantum computers, we can do that in just 200 seconds, right? So that is how quantum machines work. Their basic building block is qubit. And this is how we are representing the qubit. So the qubit state is a linear combination of the basis states, right? So this is how the qubit can be represented as the basis state. So one and zero can be the basis states. And let's say we have the constraint on alpha. Uh, any, any other constraint is necessary uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, we are doing the quantum computation. So C naught and C1 are complex numbers over here where we can start multiplying them together to do the computations on the quantum computers. So now we're going through going, uh, now we'll, I'll take you through an example as to how it actually happens. So this state is called the plus state where C naught, C naught C1 can be represented as one by root two and one by root two. So this state is called the plus state. And this state is called the minus state when it comes to quantum computing. So it's just that we are representing it using matrices. It's nothing else. We are taking a matrix and we are representing the plus state like this and the minus state like this. Now, just like that, a qubit is a sphere. You can imagine the sphere as the, the north pole as zero one and the south pole as zero minus one. And on that sphere, we have so many different, different points are there, right? So this is a more sophisticated vis visual, uh, visualization for representing qubit states with complex coefficients. It is called the block sphere, right? I will not stop on it here. In the end of the lecture, I'll also try to give you some extra reading material 
which will point to a good representation of how a block sphere actually looks like right so you can just think of it like the globe and on the globe there's a north pole and the south pole and just like there are latitudes and longitudes are there so these are the different ways to represent the state and each point so this specific point on the block sphere is called the plus state then uh, this is called the minus state this is called the zero basis state so so on and so forth then comes another important notation, which is called the Dirac notation for a single qubit. So the Dirac notation is uh, derived by Paul Dirac, which was a scientist in quantum mechanics. And he gave the bracket notation, which is the ket notation is how you denote, you, you write the ket notation like this, which denotes a column vector. Basically, it's very simple. You just have this zero and you write it as one one zero in the matrix form and you have one you write it as zero one in the matrix form so the the ket notation c can be described as c naught c1 which is equal to c naught into zero and c1 into one so this is another example of the plus state that we discussed before so in in the ket notation this is how we can actually denote the ket notation right so we take out the z so we basically split it into zeros and ones and then we describe it as the the state so for single qubit systems the dirac notation is not that beneficial to be honest we'll see its real power uh, when we talk about the multi qubit systems that is where the real power of dirac notation comes in Now let's scale it up to multiple qubits. So, so, so far we've only spoken about the single qubits, right? Now what happens if we have multiple qubits? Now classically four possible states can be either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. Now knowing both bits B1 and B2 tells us everything there is to know about the two bit system B1 comma 2, right? So if we know both of the bits, we can tell everything there is to tell about this particular system. Whereas in quantum computing, right, the four computational basis states 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1 can be in superposition of the computational basis state, right? So how can it be possible that it can be in the superposition of all the computational basis states? That is where the actual beauty of quantum computing lies. And this is not the case for quantum states. They, they can also be entangled. So that is another thing, not just superposition. Entanglement is also coming, right? So these two concepts we are going to cover extensively and uh, we need to make sure that we have a thorough understanding of these concepts as well. So Dirac notation is sensitive to the number of qubits as the ket zero can be on any number of qubits. You will usually figure out uh, from context over here that why the number of qubits grow in the come in, in, in the way as we come up uh, and as we increase the number of qubits. So more generally, we can describe the state as phi and we can give this particular column vector of size two raised to the power n. And this is how we can actually uh, go from i is equal to 0 to 2 raised to the power n minus 1, c i i. So this is how the ket notation is looking like in, in the summation form. If we'll try to go into a, a, a lot of mathematics. And we'll sometimes also denote the ith basis state in integer form for compactness rather than in binary. So instead of defining it in binary, we'll just state it in the integer form. So we don't have to write it as this long statement. We can simply write it in the integer form. So a quick example of the Dirac notations over here. So what we can do is we can take this and we can split it in the column vectors, right? Where we can use this as zero, zero. So we know that, okay, the first one is zero, zero. And the next one is zero, one. The next one is one, zero, one, one. So we'll take these zero zeros and write it as the ket form. And then besides that, we'll write this C zero zero, right? 
so it's just that this column is there right and we are using we are splitting this matrix into different different columns that is all that we are doing it's nothing else and another way to write this would be instead of just writing over here zero zero for convenience what we do sometimes is we just write it as zero over here because we know that okay this is the zeroth column then this is the first column this is the second column this is the third column i hope you're able to understand because this is something that is very fundamental and you'll have to understand in order to uh, you know dive deeper into the algorithm side right so all we do over here is that we take up what is written over here this value right as c0 and we write the uh, cat notation over here right and besides that we enter the value now we have a two qubit state psi and for example, this is an arbitrary state and we still require the sum of the squares of the amplitudes to sum to one. Now, this is the amplitude over here. So in order to make it work, we need to add up all the squares of the amplitudes. Now, I'll give you an example of a three qubit state, right? Let's say there are eight states in the superposition represented by three qubits. Ket notation gives us an easy way to read off numbers of qubits. Also, another more way, you know, another compact way to write a quantum states. So this sometimes we just write the ith state represented for even greater ease as well as shown over here. So now if you will take this, we have another state over here uh, represented by phi, right? We take out one by root two over here. Okay. Then we know, okay, this is the zero, zero, zero as over here, this is zero, zero. So this particular one is zero, 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 right? And then this one, if we'll uh, write all the possible states, this one comes out to be one, one, zero. Okay. Now, instead of writing this as, you know, this whole matrix, we can just write this state as one comma root two, then uh, zero, 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 get zero, zero, zero. And then one plus one by root two get one one zero, which is also equal to as I said before. So we know this is the zeroth column, right? So we know this state is one. So we just denote one by root two as get uh, zero plus get six, which is zero. So this particular one, the next one is at the sixth row. So we write it as uh, sorry sixth column. So we write it as zero plus six. Simple, right? So it's an easy way for us to do quantum computations rather than multiplying matrices. So now let's say, for example, we have over here discussed three qubits. Now, if we have four qubits, right? So that makes us to write a four cross four matrix. So that is very, very, uh, you know, it takes a lot of time for us to write those 16 states. So instead of that, <clears throat> we can just use the ket notations. So you can define this if you have a paper and pen, you can just describe the ket notation as a popular shorthand notation for sparse column vectors. So that's the actual definition of the ket notation, popular shorthand notation. So it's a shorthand notation for the sparse column vectors. So ket notation is for column vectors. And when we talk about the bra notation, right? That is for the row vectors. So either you can use the ket notation or you can use the, use the bra notation. That is why we have termed it the bracket notation. So some people prefer to use the other one in which we are, instead of using the column vectors, we are just sparsing the row vectors. So we are, it's all the same, but instead the, uh, the notation uh, changes. So now we come to another important point, which is the tensor product of the vectors, right? So now let's say we have two ket notations denoted by P and Q. So we can calculate the tensor product of the vectors. So as I said before, the book that we referred to the Nelson and Chuang book, which is one of the most important books, right? So you can use that book to understand some of the concepts that are there. They've beautifully explained it. There are also numericals that you can solve in order to enhance your 
uh, you know mathematical concepts and practice some of these problems that are there when multiplying qubits uh, all those stuff is out there so we saw on the previous slide that uh, we can form a two qubit system by creating a superposition over all the two bit strings right and a three qubit system by creating a superposition over all the three bit bit strings in fact, underneath the hood of what is called a tensor product, a tensor product enables us to take two vector spaces and form a larger vector space. That is what the tensor product is doing. Classical bits can be only one of uh, the two raised to the power n states, right? But uh, the n qubits can be in a superposition of the two raised to the power n states. Now, what do I mean by that? So, Let's say we have this p uh, p uh, vector, right? So what we can do is we can multiply it together using the tensor product. So it's basically the tensor product. We don't say multiplication. So if we input two states, the p state and q state with dimensions of m and n respectively. Now we create a new uh, state, which is the p tensor product q state with dimension m n. So this is how the, the, the tensor product work. We just take P0 and multiply it by Q0. Simple so far, right? So now you can see that why two qubit states cover a state space of dimension four and a three qubits cover the dimension eight and then N qubits will cover the dimension two raised to the power N. So now what is happening is in classical computers, it can be only P naught Q naught. That is in one single state. But in quantum computing, it is in all the possible states at one time. The P0, Q0 state also, the Q0, Q1 state, P0, uh, Q1 state also. That is how we can represent a larger number of bit strings with the help of quantum computers. And you can just treat the tensor products with the multiplication rules that are out there. So multiplying... Uh, uh, let's say we want to figure out the tensor product of zero and zero, uh, zero state, which is the zero ket state, we call this, and zero ket state, we do the tensor product, which is basically the state one zero, the matrix. So we can represent this state as a matrix, which is one zero. And when we multiply it, so this is what we essentially get. And as we have discussed before, so we can just write it as zero zero and also either zero. And another example below is this particular example. So we can take zero one matrix, then we do a tensor product with one zero, and this is the resulting. So I'll just go back and show you, uh, this is how the multiplication is happening. So we do the multiplication, and then we arrive at one zero state, which we can also write it as two, because this is the two column over here. So the first one is zero. The second, second one is one. Third one is two. And that is how we can go on and uh, with, so, uh, you know, we can calculate the tensor products, so on and so forth. And this is just the mathematical expression. If we'll expand it, if we'll expand what is happening, this is what actually is happening under the hood. So if you want to write down, you can write it down. If you want to take a screenshot, you can take a screenshot and use it for later purpose. <clears throat> so now comes the part of entanglement. So we've discussed superposition so far, but what about entanglement, right? So when we say entangled, two, two qubits are entangled, what do we mean, right? When two qubits are entangled, the state of the two qubit system can not be represented as a tensor products of states of individual qubits. In this case, uh, the state of the system is more than the states of the parts. So now let's say, let's take two examples, entangled and unentangled. And unentangled on this side, entangled on that side. We have Alice and Bob. Now, if you'll see that we can write these states separately, right? So this is the state of Alice and this is the state of Bob. But when they are entangled, we cannot break it down. 
we cannot write the state separately. So that is the main difference between an entangled state and an entangled state. And you can look at the state and you can figure out that if this is an entangled state or is this an unentangled state. So, so far we have looked at qubits. We have looked at what is quantum computing? Why is it fundamentally different to classical computing? So now we move forward towards quantum gates. How does a quantum gate work? How do we perform operations on qubits and transition between different states? So this is all this happens with the help of quantum gates. We can move from one state to the other. We can multiply, we can uh, add, we can do all sorts of things when it comes to quantum gates. So when we say any circuit can be built, we, we, we mean it can be used to express any Boolean function, right? So this is the universal set of gates from which we can build any circuit. We compose those gates to make larger circuits and to express more complex com computation, right? That is what a logical gate actually does. Uh, we can then express more and more states using complex computation. So quantum gates are also equivalent of these logical gates and they are the building blocks of quantum computation. So you might have heard of AND gate, OR gate, NOT gate and these gates are there when we perform the normal Boolean calculations, right? Similarly, in quantum computing also we have these gates that are universal to performing calculations on quantum computers, right? So without those gates, we cannot perform any calculation. Now there are multiple uh, quantum gates that are there. Single qubit gates are there, which perform operations on single qubits. Then we have multiple qubit gates that perform operations on multiple qubits at the same time. And I'm going to give you a brief introduction about all these gates and you should learn them by heart so that, you know, whenever you are performing calculations, you know, because right now, you know, how the AND gates work, the OR gate works, you know the truth table also. If I tell you to write down the truth table, you can write down the truth table easily. But it's very different when it comes to quantum gates. A single qubit quantum gate is essentially just a 2 cross 2 matrix. That's all it is. Just a 2 cross 2 matrix. Now, using these 2 cross 2 matrix, we can do amazing things. And the first is that we represent these qubit state is a vector of size two, right? Every qubit state is essentially a vector of size two. And to apply a gate to a qubit, we just multiply the vector by the matrix. That's all we do. So, so far we know that qubit state, right? We denote them as vectors and the single qubit gates are matrices of, of two cross two. So, in order to make a gate work, we just take that qubit state and multiply it with the matrix. So now comes the most important gate, the X gate, which is the bit flip gate. It swaps the amplitude of one uh, and zero. So we'll look at this. So this is the X gate. This is how it is represented as I said. Every gate is essentially a two cross two matrix. And this is fundamentally how the X gate looks like. We cannot change this. This is universal. And we can then, it is used to swap the amplitudes of every state. So I'll give you an example over here. Let's say we have X, which is the X gate. And then we have this vector C naught C1, which is denoted by C naught C1. Now we can equate that to, now we just take X, we write it as the matrix and then we multiply it together. And then it comes out to be C1 and C0. So essentially it has done the bit flip and now instead of having C0, C1, we have C1, C0, right? And this is how the calculation is happening at the, uh, you know, in terms of the, uh, the, the ket notations, if we look at it this way, we have X over here, we are multiplying X with the state. So we know that C naught is represented as C naught 
and as I discussed before, that it is the zeroth column. So that is why we have written zero over here. Plus, we know that this is how we are representing this uh, vector as C1 into one, which is the first. Uh, so the first one is zero, and the next one is one, and this is how we it looks like. Then we multiply it together. So it's nothing but multiplying them individually. And then we arrive at this particular notation. So it's flipping X, it's flipping zero to one and it's flipping one to zero. Simple, right? So this is how we can also do it. And if you want to have a look at the, uh, the block sphere, right? Now this is a 2D representation of block sphere. We obviously, I cannot show you a 3D representation on a, on a laptop. For that, we'll have to wear, uh, you know, we'll have to have a globe and then I'll have to show it to you. But on the surface, this is how it looks like. Let's say we have this particular state, minus one comma zero. We can flip it to zero comma minus one. Simple, correct? We're just taking, uh, let's say we have this particular state, minus one by root two and one by root two. So we just flip it to one by root two and minus one by root two. This is also the minus state that we had discussed earlier. And this is the plus state. So with the plus state, there's nothing we can do because it's already both of them are same. Both of the columns are same one by root two, one by root two. So even if we'll apply the X gate over here, nothing is going to happen, right? Only when we apply it to the minus state, it changes the, the it, it swaps the amplitude and this is the resultant. So now comes another important gate, the Z gate, right? Which is the Z gate, the phase flip. So before we have discussed how to swap the amplitude, right? Uh, which is basically, if these are the two columns, then the values change from the first column to the second column. That is all we are doing, right? Now, when it comes to the Z gate, which is the phase flip gate, right? It multiplies the amplitude of one by minus one. That is all that it does. And this is how the Z gates look like. And this is the, how the X gate looks like. So there's a difference over here. And again, this is universal. We cannot change how the Z gate is represented. It is, this is the only representation of the Z gate you will find everywhere, right? And now we'll take an example quickly. Let's say we have the Z gate and we are multiplying it with the column uh, with these two column vectors c0 and c1 so this is ultimately we get c0 and then at the bottom the phase changes to minus c1 correct so if i'll take you in the example form so this is what is actually happening when we multiply z with zero so it remains zero but when we multiply z with one we get minus C1, 1. Are you able to understand? Because see, ultimately the first part is not changed because we are changing the phase over here, right? So only the second column is affected and it adds a minus value over there. That is all you need to under, uh, you know, re remember for now. And this is what happens when we do it on the block sphere. When we apply, the phase zero or uh, uh, the, the, the phase flip or the Z gate on the state one, it changes to zero state, right? And then when we, sorry, the zero, the zero state, when we apply it on the zero state, nothing happens. And when we apply on, on this particular, uh, on the first, uh, zero one, it changes to zero minus one simple as, as I told you before and we have covered in this example. And similarly, over here, if you look at minus one comma root two on the top left side, it is minus one comma root two. And on the second column, it is one by uh, root two. When we apply the Z gate, it changes to minus one by root two and minus one by root two. It's nothing but just adding a minus one on the second column vector. That is all you need to understand, right? So recap X gate, it changes the column vector. Uh, C1 goes to C2, C2 goes to C1. 
And when it comes to the Z gate, we just uh, add a minus sign to C2. So this is the basic example of, of how this X gate and the Z gate works. So now comes one of the most fundamentally important gate, which is the H gate. Now H gate converts the basis state to a superposition, right? So how does that happen? Let's take a look at it. So we have the H gate defined as this column, uh, this particular uh, matrix one by root two, one, one, one comma one minus one. And when we are applying the H gate, it changes the state and converts the basis state into a superposition of states. Now, how does that happen? Let's take a look. Now, let's say we want to apply the H gate uh, to this particular qubit. So now what we have is changing the state to plus state. Now, it is very counterintuitive to explain you how this happens, but as a fundamental rule, I'll just explain you what is going on at the back end with this example of block sphere, right? So what we essentially do over here is, let's say we have the state in zero one, right? When we apply the edge gate, it's put, it puts the state into a superposition of two states, which is the one comma root one by root two and minus one by root two, which is also denoted by the minus, uh, get minus notation, right? So that is how we are essentially making sure that when we start, uh, when we are putting the state into superposition, this is how the state gets affected by the H gate. So now we'll discuss simple single qubit gates and have a look at how these sing simple single qubit gates are working. So the X gate, as I've discussed, the poly X gate, which swaps the amplitude of one and zero. Then we have the poly Z gate, which multiply the amplitude of one by minus one. So these gates are very simple. So now you may ask, are there any fundamental quantum gates? So the answer is yes. And to make quantum computing interesting, we require such operations. And one desirable operation is to be able to put a state into a superposition state. So we often require that we have to put these states into a state of superposition. And uh, that is where the edge gate comes into place, right? The simplest way of putting the gates in superposition. So I'll just take a moment and I want you all to look at this and see what actually is changing when we are applying the edge gate. Right. So first of all, you might have a question, where does one by root two comes from? So this is nothing but when I spoke about the, uh, the squares, right? So we are just taking the two states. So let's say if there are three qubits, uh, then we'll have an eight over here. Right. So this is how it works. And we have these. So I'll take you to the most simplest form of the edge gate over here. This is the most simplest form. It gets complex as we increase the number of qubits. So essentially just remember what is the edge gate? The edge gate is a way to put the state into superposition. That is all. And why do I be putting it in the state of superposition is that because we require uh, the superposition is a very important phenomenon in quantum computing. And when we are, want to put the state in superposition, we want to do certain calculations on it. And the edge gates helps us to do that. Now there are many ways to put the state in quantum superposition. But the Hadamard gate is the most simplest way of putting that in, in, in the superposition states. And you can just remember this, these two particular examples that if we have the zero state over here, it changes into the plus state. And when we have the one state, it changes into the minus state. So these are the most fundamental principles that we need to understand and that when we have the zero state, it changes into the plus state. When we have the one state, it changes into minus state. So now this is the Dirac notation for inner product. So earlier I had spoken to you regarding the bra notation, uh, sorry, the ket notation. So now we'll talk about the bra notation. So look at how different the bra notation actually is, right? 
So instead of denoting it via the column vectors, now we are denoting it via the row vectors. Correct. So earlier we had the zero cat was one zero, which was like this, but now we have it like this. And this is the main difference between the, uh, the bracket notation that it is denoting as a row vector. And how do we change that? So it is nothing but the adjoint of cat. So we have zero dagger over here, right? Uh, if we essentially want to create, we want to change the state from the bra state to the cat state, we just do the adjoint of that. And then we have the inner product of the vector psi and phi bracket. So this is how we can denote them. And we will use the bracket notation to discuss both quantum gates and the quantum measurements. So we'll use both of, uh, we'll use both of these states to denote the quantum gates and, and its measurements. So it's something that we all should be able to know. So now these are, this notation will be more convenient in the, in the next module when we'll focus on that. And when we talk about the multi qubits gates, as I had said before, so just write this down. If you have a pen and paper, you can remember these by heart. So I'll just give you a quick recap of what we have done so far. Uh, we've taken three three essential gates we have discussed. As of, So first we've done, uh, we've gone through the, the basics of real numbers, complex numbers, how are they denoted? Then we've gone into the concepts of uh, the gates, how they're, the qubits, first of all, how the qubit is represented, what are the column vectors, what are the row vectors and how you know, we are using the, the gates, the X gate, the Y gate, sorry, the Z gate and the H gate to uh, multiply and do complex co calculations on quantum computers. Now, just take a look at this table. This is the single qubit gate table. This is how the single qubits are represented. As I said, there are, of course, more number of single qubit gates, including the ones that, uh, you know, use complex amplitudes. So please learn, learn these gates in, in this and, you know, use this as a quick reference, as a reminder of what exactly is happening underneath the hood when we are doing the quantum computations. So with that, we'll end this particular module and uh, we'll just take a quick break over here. I just want you all to grasp these concepts. We'll just take a quick five minutes break over here because I know this, this is a lot of information to digest. And after the break, we'll delve into uh, a more, more of the quantum algorithm sides as to what are the basic quantum algorithms that are there. So, so far I've given you an overview of how we are doing the computation so that you don't have to learn any programming language as I've told you before. This is a high level overview of what are quantum gates, what are quantum circuits, and what are quantum algorithms, which you'll co cover in the uh, coming session. So just give me a, a, a break. I, I just want to give you all a break of five minutes and then I'll see you back in five minutes. So you can digest what we've uh, covered so far.
so hello everyone i'm back again so thank you so much for staying in tune so we'll quickly go through the next uh, module just give me a minute i'll share my screen So this is just the lecture two that we are covering right now, and this is the second part of the of the lecture. So I know we have very less time, and there are a lot of things that need to be covered as of now. So I'll try to be quick, uh, with my uh this this particular uh, lecture, and then hope we'll have some time left for the third lecture, which will be on the quantum algorithms side, which I know you are uh, you know very keenly looking forward to. So we'll continue where we left off with the quantum gates, right? And this is a review of the single qubit quantum gates that we had discussed before. So every single qubit quantum gate is a two cross two matrix, right? And a qubit state, for example, is a vector of size two, which is denoted by phi. And to apply a gate to a qubit, we multiply the vector by the matrix. And a multi-qubit quantum gate is something which is now a 2 raised to the power n cross 2 raised to the power n unitary matrix. Now here comes the important part. A single qubit gate is just, it just is, it's a 2 cross 2 matrix, right? But when we are talking about a multi-qubit quantum gate, now that's a 2 raised to the power n cross 2 raised to the power 2n, a unitary matrix. Now what's a unitary matrix? Uh, just a quick reminder over here that a unitary matrix means that u dagger u is equal to u u dagger is equal to i. Now the qubit state is a vector of size 2 raised to the power n and in order to apply a gate to a qubit we multiply the vector by the matrix. So now it's very important over here that the vector is matches the size of the unitary matrix. Right. Otherwise, we cannot do the uh, matrix multiplication. And the Dirac notation for the inner product, as we have discussed before, it's just a recap that we are going through. So, which is the bra notation, which is which denotes a row vector instead of a column vector. And uh, the inner product of the vector sine phi is a bracket. This is how we used to denote them. So, if we have this row vector and this column vector, which is the ket and which is equal to this psi naught star phi plus uh, the whole mathematical formula. So now comes another important gate, which is the controlled knot gate. And this is how we denote the controlled knot gate. This is the matrix representation of the control knot gate. Now I'll give you an exercise. So we've discussed about unitaries. Now, I want you guys to verify that is it a unitary matrix or not, which is, uh, if you've forgotten a reminder that it's the adjoint of itself, which is applying it twice, returns us to the original state. So it's the identity matrix, the I matrix. So now what do we do? What happens if we apply the control not gate to a state? So we have the state denoted over here, C0, C1. So now we have C2 and C3 because C0 gates is a, a four cross four matrix, right? So we need to have additional additional uh, columns over here, which is C2 and C3. Otherwise we cannot multiply that. So now what it does it, it's just like the Z gate and uh, sorry, not the, not the Z gate, the X gate. Right. Remember, we spoke about the X gate where it changed the, the state of C1 to C2 and C2 to C1. Right. 
So similarly over here also, it's just changing the state of C2 to C3 and C3 to C2. That's all that it does. It just takes up the last two columns and flips the, the last two columns. So that's all you need to remember as a fundamental principle, right? Another recap, X gate, it flips uh, the from C1 to C2. Then we discuss the, the Z gate, which adds a minus sign. That's all it does. Then we discuss the H gate, which what, what it essentially did was it put the state into a superposition state. And let's say if we have one state, it will go to the plus state and zero state to minus state. And now, for example, if we have the C naught gate, so it will just flip the C2 to C3 and C3 to C2. That's all. And if you want to go down into the mathematical notations or using the bracket the or, or the ket bra notation. So this is how the CX or this control not gate looks like. We also say it as CX gate. And this is the calculation that happens. So the first qubit over here is the control qubit and the second qubit is the target qubit. So it's just the quantum equivalent of the classical XOR gate. So I hope you guys remember the XOR gate. So it's nothing but the quantum equivalent of the classical XOR gate. And you can say that the X gate is the classical equivalent of the NOT gate, right? So if we have these states, the first qubit is the, uh, the, is the control qubit and the second qubit is the target qubit. So what essentially this means is if the first qubit is one, which means that this, this is one, which is the control qubit, which means it gets activated and now it will flip the second qubit. But if this is zero, right, then it won't do anything. We'll see it. I hope we have an example. So now entangled qubits, uh, so we'll, we'll just have a look over here. What happens if we apply the CX gate? To these two gate to these this particular quantum state so this is how we denote this quantum state right and once we apply the cx gate it will not do anything right so it, it is not like every time we apply it it will change so there's another concept over here which is the phase kickback which keeps the qubit not entangled right and propagates the phase of the target qubit to the control qubit so over here, you saw that CX gate, if this state is plus and this is minus, right? So it will just change the whole state to minus minus. That is essentially what phase kickbacks mean. And this is an important term that you'll again, uh, you know, come across very often. Then obviously we have the Toffoli gate, which is a double control C0, right? So, so, so far we discussed the C0 gate, which had two qubits. Right, one was the control bit and the other one was the target bit, which essentially flipped the states. Right now, we have the Toffoli gate, which is a double control not gate, which means that we can control that using uh, two, two qubits. Now, you can essentially think as the control gate as the remote. Right, so if we press the remote, right, uh, we have I'll, I'll give you the example of the C naught gate over here. We have a remote, which uh, if we turn it on, only then the, the, the state is flipped. But what happens in Toffoli gate is we have two remotes, right? And both of them need to be one. That is both of them need to be turned on so that the third qubit can change its uh, state. So it's essentially written over here that Toffoli negates the third qubit if and only if the first two qubits are both in one state. Which means that using the both, so let's say we have a remote and in that remote we have a button and, and there's a light, a red light and a green light. There are two possible states. Red means it is on, or sorry, off and green means it is uh, on, right? Now, both of the remotes need to have their, uh, you know, icon as green. That is the go ahead for uh, the Toffoli gate to uh, do the operation on the third qubit. It negates the third qubit, which means it flips uh, the... Now in, in Ket bra notation, this is how it looks like. I know it might... Things are getting much complicated now, 
but bear with me this is just nothing what we are doing is we are doing the tensor product which we have already discussed before and then this is the ket bra notation of the ccx gate so this is again universal again we cannot do anything about it this is just how it uh, works and over here this is the second qubit this is the first qubit and this is the third qubit which is the x which it it essentially is applying the x gate on the third qubit and this is the first qubit these are the states of the first and second qubit and now if we look at it in the matrix form now that is where the bracket notation comes in now we cannot write down this matrix in 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 such a long way right it's just not possible so what we essentially do is we denote it using the ket bra notation and this is nothing but this notation over here that's essentially what it is So now if you have a quantum gate, you can always define it con its control variant using a register of qubits as control. You can always control the, the state, right? That is that is why it, it, they are called controlled gates. And the gate is applied if all the control qubits are in state one. So it's not just a Foley gate can be used for a three qubits. We can create our own gate where we have four states and, and you know, that is where the beauty comes in that you can do it with as much qubits as possible. And it will only happen if all the control bits are in the one state and nothing happens otherwise. Nothing will happen otherwise. Even if one of the state is zero, still nothing will happen. So now I'll give you the example of a controlled Z gate. So far we've discussed the controlled NOT gate, but what happens if we apply a controlled Z gate? It means that the Z gate will only happen when the control, both the controls or one the control uh, or one of the control is uh, green or on in the on state. So as you remember the Z gate, right guys, in the Z gate, it is just taking the plus state and changing into the minus state, the last one over here. You can see that it is adding the minus sign over here. It should if you look over here, it's plus plus and it adds the minus sign. This is the control Z gate, the CZ gate applying on this particular state. So now comes an important question. What set of gates allows us to express an arbitrary gate? So now there must come a point where just like in, uh, you know, NAND gate and, and R is a universal gate and we can create all the gates out of that. So what are the universal gates over here? So the H gate, T gate, C naught gate. So they are a universal set. So we can use these three gates to define any particular quantum state, right? So just like that, there are multiple sets which we can use uh, to, you know, create our own set of gates. So this is where the hardware comes in and the hardware architecture comes in where we apply these, you know, there is a certain set of universal gates, which we are applying on the quantum uh, circuits. So now let me take you back to the notations review. I hope you take some key takeaways from this. So I'll emphasize more on the key concepts that are used and let's summarize several different notations that can be used to express quantum algorithms. The matrix notation is one of them. The Dirac notation is another one of them. The circuit notation is another one of them. And finally, the programming notation is also there, right? So there are four ways in which you can denote that. And these all notations will come in handy later on when you want to be fluent in, in the programming part, you need to be fluent in the first three parts, which is the matrix, the Dirac and the circuit notation, right? So it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, assignments that you'll have to complete. And if you are open to that, I'll also share a few assignments with you all. So you can, you know, practice uh, your skills and, and enhance whatever you have learned so far. Try to do the matrix multiplication, the Dirac multiplication, tensor products, circuit notation. All of those things definitely help a lot. So coming back, this is how the matrix notation look like. The quantum state on n qubits is a vector of 2 raised to the power n numbers. 
a quantum gate acting on n qubits is a 2 raised to the power n cross 2 raised to the power n matrix. And this is how the matrix looks like. So matrix notation is very inconvenient. So don't emphasize on the matrix notation. The Dirac notation and the circuit notations are more important. That is why I'll skip to the Dirac notation. So far, I have not come to the circuit notation, guys. I have only discussed the Dirac notation and the matrix notation. So another example of Dirac notation, a quick recap is that a quantum state acting on n qubits is a sum of up to 2 raised to the power n ket vectors, right? And this is how, if you recall, we had discussed earlier on i raised to the power i is equal to 0, 2 raised to the power n minus 1, if and, and c i i. And the quantum gate acting on n qubits can be a sum of up to 4 raised to the power n ket bra terms. That is where, again, it can get very inconvenient uh, for sparks and matrices. So we can denote those matrices very conveniently. And it allows us a very convenient way for orderly states and matrices. Now, again, if we are using even more number of qubits, right, then again, it gets very inconvenient, uh, you know, not very convenient for large and dense notation. That is where the circuit notation comes in, right? And this circuit notation is the quantum state. This is the horizontal line. The wire is the circuit notation. And the quantum gate in between the edge gate is the box or a symbol, right? So it doesn't represent quantum. Uh, so it's very, very, very popular. You must have seen IBM quantum composers that are using it. And it supports the procedures, but loops are not there. And classical conditions are there. And it goes quite unreadable very fast. Now, if we have 16 qubits, for example, we cannot again go with the circuit notation. And that is where the programming notation comes in. That is why essentially everything that we'll have to do is with the help of programs. And we don't have to focus much on all these, all these things if you want to become a quantum software developer. So that is why you need to focus on, on those programs that you are writing because ultimately they will be, the programs will be only convenient way to represent all these gates. If we have a hundred qubits, we cannot write down those hundred qubits, right? So ultimately we need to have a fundamental knowledge of the matrix multiplication. Then we need to have another knowledge of the bracket notation, then the circuit notation, and then the best one is the programming notation. So this, this you can have a look at it again and see for yourself what happens if I increase the number of qubits to, you know, 16. So far, we've discussed the states of the qubits and performing operations on qubits. The next logical step is extracting information about the qubit states. Otherwise, there is not much point in performing the operation in the first place, right? If we are not able to extract the result, why are we doing the calculations, right? So measurements is one of the most important concepts that we are going to discuss now. So firstly, I'll have to again go back and give you how does the information readout happens in the classical state as compared to the classical state. In order to retrieve information and read out result of the storage or the computation, we cannot look at a qubit and learn its states, namely the value of C0 and C1 that we have discussed so far. Quantum mechanics dictates that we can only restrict learn the restricted information about the states namely one of the basis states with the probability of its corresponding amplitude state, which is squared of the amplitude, right? And the, the sum of both of them needs to come out to be one, which means that the qubit state is normalized to length one and the qubit state is thus a unit vector in a two dimensional complex vector plane. Now, Information readout is something which is very complex in quantum computing. And why is that? I'll give you an example. First of all, I want you to stop and think about this example that I'm going to give you for now. Right? Let's say we have a cat and that cat is in a box. And in that box, we have put poison. 
so there are two states in which the cat can be either the cat has drank the poison and it has died or the cat has not drank any poison and it is alive so the two possible states are there right and it's kept inside a box and we cannot see what is happening inside the box now you might think that the cat is in two states either one or i either alive or dead but that is not how the world works the world is quantum right and at the quantum level things are happening in superposition right so the cat until we open the box is in both of the states it's dead also and alive also at the same time but when we open the box which is equivalent to the measurement right which means we are actually measuring right this quantum state will collapse into one single state so it, it's not in superposition state anymore it's collapsed to the one single state we call this the wave function collapse and now we can see for ourselves is the cat alive or dead so obviously at at such a large level this is not possible right this is called the schrodinger's cat it's a thought experiment for you to understand how the measurements work so at the quantum level right the the qubits are in all possible states at one time just like i had showed you before and when we measure that right when we are measuring it it collapses into one single state right so now how do we get that okay if there's a superposition that is happening where is actually the result line we denote that using probabilities we say that we have a probability that the answer is in this particular scenario right either c0 or c1 it's a probability that we are defining and if you look at the example over here it essentially means that we cannot compute the information readout in the same way we do it for classical computers it's a very fundamentally different way and i'll give you another example it's like you have let's say x amount of money in your account when you use classical computers you get an actual number that i have this amount of x amount of rupees in the account but when it comes to quantum computers you get a probability that you have this amount of rupees x amount of rupees this is the probability of having x amount of rupees this is the probability of having y amount of rupees right so that is how we use probabilities to get the answers in quantum computers so now there are some interesting misconceptions around the measurements that i'd like to clarify we can do a lot of computation in parallel but measurements prevent us from using this directly and often people think that the measurement destroys the qubit itself usually if they look at a quantum circuit quantum wires become classical the qubit persists so that is another misconception that is there so as i said measurement destroys superposition but it does not destroy the qubit right and measurement limits the power of quantum computing that is again as i said as the wave function collapses so we get classical results it's like the wires that are quantum mechanical you can say that they become classical right so that is the main difference and quantum systems must also be protected from unwarranted unwanted measurements which we call as decoherence now measurements in computational basis computational basis is nothing but uh, vectors 0 and 1 and we can always represent the qubit state as a superposition so we take this and we represent it as the superposition if we measure the qubit in the basis 0 1 we get outcome 0 with the probability of c0 square right and the outcome 1 with the probability of c1 square as i gave you the example of the bank account right so you can consider it that there is the probability of having x amount of money is c0 square right and the probability of having y amount of money is c1 square now let's do some exercises what is the probability of measuring 0 and 1 in each of these state right
So now the measure, if we'll switch to a different measuring base, right? So we'll get the result. So over here, there's not much that we can get out of this, but the, the probabilities are there for us to measure. I'll also go through another important concept, which is the orthogonality, right? Two vectors are orthogonal if their inner product is zero, right? And this is another example that I'm giving you. Now, the norm of a vector is defined as this particular equation that you can see. And a vector is a unit vector or normalized if it is equal to one. Normalize a vector by dividing it by its norm. So that is how we normalize a vector. So you can take a screenshot of this if you want to, uh, you know, come across it again. Now, if you want to do orthogonal measurement in another basis, so this is how we go through the same process again, but this time on a different basis and the qubit state might also collapse while we are doing the measurement. As I said, the qubit state called this state and it gets renormalized. So that is the outcome of applying the operator. So this is done in the Dirac notation now. Earlier we were using the other notation. Now we are using the Dirac notation to figure out the measurements. We can also do measurement in another basis which is the Hadamard basis. right? So there are different ways of measuring it. You might have a, a, a different basis state for measurements, uh, just like you have different ways of operating the gates. So post measurement states will be plus and minus respectively. We can also measure many qubit systems similarly, right? So there are multiple ways of doing this, as I said before, and we can measure many qubit systems similarly. So now how do we observe relative phase? So how to distinguish ortho orthogonal states uh, 1 by root 2, 1, 1 and 1 by root 2, 1, minus 1. And measuring in computational basis gives 50% 0 and 50% 1 for both. Measuring in a different basis. So that is how we can observe the relevant uh, uh, relative phase. And as you can always represent measurement in a different basis, is just that we are applying some unitary, doing some measurement in that computational basis and then applying the adjoint of that unitary. So for Hadamard basis, the unitary to apply is H. So we have to apply a unitary to do in order to get the, uh, the, the measurements in a different base. So now here comes the things that we cannot do with measurement. If we are given a single copy of the state that is guaranteed to be psi or phi and it is not equal to zero, you cannot do a measurement to us to say which state it, it is. And you can try to maximize the probability that you are right. Or you can do a measurement that allows you to never be wrong if you are allowed to say, I don't know. Right. So find out the amplitudes from a single copy of state and give multiple copies. Again, and multiple copies, you can do an estimate of, you know, if we are measuring in multiple states, we can find out the probability using uh, different, different copies and figure out an estimate. So now come, comes another important concept, which is measuring multi-qubit systems. So far, we have discussed how to measure single qubit systems, but now we are going to measure multiple qubit systems and in different, different basis states. Consider a system of n qubits in state q. The two raised to the power n basis states of the system are b naught and so on and so forth. If we measure the system in this particular set of the basis states, we'll get outcome b1 with the probability as this, and the system will collapse to b1. For example, if we are measuring this state in the computational basis, right? And the partial measurement is considering a system of n qubits in state Q. We measure the first qubit of the system in computational basis. It's very similar to measurements in Dirac notation. We'll get the outcome B1 with the probability B1, Bi, Q, normalized to, uh, and then raised to the power two. But this inner product will be a vector the system will collapse to this state 
and get renormalized right so i know this might sound very tricky over here and there are some concepts that you know we need thorough understanding but i'll try to cover as much as possible uh, in in this short period of time so i want you to take a look at this and see what is happening in the case of partial measurement right this is the example of the partial measurement that we are uh, going through we are taking considering the state uh, so this is the state that we are considering and we are measuring the first qubit in the 0 comma 1 basis as i said there can be the measurement can be done in different different basis so we are measuring in this particular basis right so firstly it is not normalized yet so the probability of measuring zero, this is how we denote that, is two by three. So if we'll calculate that, this is what we'll get. And if we measure zero, the system collapses to a single state. And similarly, we get the probability of measuring one as well. So now comes the no cloning th theorem. So what is the new no cloning theorem? Is it's, it's essentially that, can we copy an unknown state of a qubit? Let's assume that there is a unitary clone transformation C and we take the inner product of these equations and indeed it is very easy to come up with an example of a unitary transformation that would clone the orthogonal states. So what pair of operation and scratch state will clone state 0 and 1 which is the C0 and 0. Right. So after taking the inner product our cloning only works on orthogonal or identical states. So that is something that we need to keep in mind, the no cloning theorem that uh, it's very important to understand no cloning theorem and it has application in uh, a lot of algorithm in quantum computing. So no cloning theorem versus the measurements. We cannot distinguish non-orthogonal states perfectly and we cannot clone the non-orthogonal state. And that's the relationship of the no cloning theorem and the quantum measurements. How could we build a cloning device for a pair of non-orthogonal states if we were able to distinguish them? Right. So this, this is something that we need to figure out. And now here comes uh, the, so now I think we'll skip to the third, the third uh, module over here. I think we have, we still have some time. So I'll quickly try to cover those topics as well. And, you know, then we can have a, a short discussion. So before that, also, we have a few key takeaways that I would also like to share regarding, uh, you know, our uh, application as well, right? So I'll just figure those out as well. Yes. So now we come to the simple algorithms that are there. So I know there's a lot of slides that still needs to be covered. So I'll just quickly take you uh, on a brief, uh, you know, intro to all the algorithms that are there. So we've discussed Bernstein Bazirani in the, in when we were discussing the syllabus of this. We had also discussed Deutsch Yosa. All these algorithms are there. But the first algorithm that comes to our mind is the teleportation algorithm. Now you might be wondering, teleportation? That's a fancy word right there, correct? So what, what we are doing over here is, this is a good way to denote how uh, it doesn't allow us to do anything as exciting as you might think. Okay, that we are teleporting people over here, but that's not how it works. So it's a very different way of how we are teleporting uh, the states of the qubits. 
So that's essentially what we are trying to do. So now, quantum protocols tend to be, you know, uh, they are very, very, very in non-intuitive when it comes to the protocols, right? And for example, Alice needs to deliver a qubit state. So this is the qubit state to Bob. And Alice has a qubit state in this state, but does not know the state as of now. She can only send the classical information to Bob. Now, what does she do in this particular uh, state? Alice cannot measure the qubit to get information about the state. So this is done using the no cloning and the measurement principles. Plus, since the state takes on a value in continuous space, she couldn't even precisely, precisely describe uh, it to Bob if she did not know the state. Now, there's a way to exactly do this and I'm going to tell you how. If Alice knew alpha and beta, she could send Bob the values, you know, that, that can be done. And if Alice does not know alpha or beta, she can't learn them. So the way to do is that what if they share an entangled pair of qubits beforehand, right? So that is where entanglement comes in. What if she can, she shares an entanglement qubit, a, a pair with Bob beforehand, and then she can transmit, you know, deliver the state to her without knowing the state. So Bell, I'll, I'll give you uh, the most fundamental states in quantum computing. These are called the Bell states. They're also called the EPR pairs, which is Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen pairs. So we've seen those pairs before we introduced superposition, but I did not mention them specifically. And we can see that each individual state is normalized and each pair of states is orthogonal. So these are the two main char characteristics of Bell states. And this is how we denote them and in, in, you know how we arrive to those states and these states form the bell bases as we've discussed different different bases uh computational bases h bases these are the bell bases for two cube two qubit states and you can check that they are normalized and orthogonal now teleportation protocol so this is how the teleportation protocol actually works alice and bob share a pair of entangled qubits Alice entangles her data qubit with her half of the pair. Alice then measures her qubits and sends the result to Bob. Then Bob applies a fix-up to his half of the pair. So we'll divide this into uh, three different parts. And with the interest of time, I'll try to skip this so that you know we can uh, cover as much as possible. But it does get complicated over here. And to explain this, uh, would be very, very difficult without a, a you know, blackboard or a, a whiteboard. So that is where we have already covered all these concepts, right? And they're available out there on YouTube. So if you want to delve much more deeper into how this happens and, uh, you know, what are the mathematical concepts behind teleportation? How, how does it work? We have set, uh, you know, modules that we have covered uh, in our videos on YouTube. So do check them out. And with that, I'll also stop. I know there's a lot of things that we've covered so far. And I'll now try to give you a way as to how you can dive deeper into the quantum world, right? So what are the ways in which you can learn quantum computing that are out there? So at Silico Fellow Quantum, what we do is we have a lot of free courses on quantum computing. So somebody like you can just go out there and, and, you know, watch those lectures on YouTube and I'm going to give you a short demo. So before going ahead, I'm just going to stop this over here and take up any questions that you might have. Uh, good, good afternoon, sir. Yes. Um, so uh, it was a really uh, clear patient uh, description of uh, quantum computing. It was really uh, nice. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, we would uh, like to go to the YouTube and uh, learn more. Sir, uh, as uh, you are from my industry, uh, 
I would like to, I am interested to know, or we are interested to know what you do in uh, sil uh, silica uh, feller and uh, how do you look at the future of uh, quantum computing? Uh, still uh, in the hardware part, uh, they say it is uh, in the research stage. So we would like to know your view, sir, and uh, how to start one. Definitely, yes. definitely. So at Silico Fella Quantum, uh, we are building quantum chips. So the quantum chip is the uh, fundamental element of a quantum computer. So it's called the heart of a quantum computer. That is where the quantum computation happens. And each qubit is an artificial atom that we are creating. So we've reached a point in humanity where we can now create artificial atoms instead of transistors and harness these atoms to do quantum computation, right? So we build the chips of the quantum computers that go inside a quantum computer. And I hope you've seen how a quantum computer looks like. So we build the chips of those quantum computers and we see that in the next few years, there's going to be a huge demand for quantum computers, right? And that is why we are making sure that we can supply those chips when there's a huge demand of quantum computers so we can have our chips inside the quantum computers. Our chips are called Kohinoor. So we want to build these quantum chips in India and you know sell it to everybody in, in the world so everybody can have a piece of Kohinoor as well. I hope Thank that you, answers sir. your question. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is a bit clear for us. Yes. So with that, what I'll tell you to do is, so if you have a mobile phone with you, right, you can go to uh, the internet, open Play Store, right? You can just open Play Store and download our application. So I'll share my screen with you now and give you a brief overview of what exactly apart from the hardware side, right? We also build software and we also want to teach quantum computing. So we figured out a way to teach quantum computing to people out there. And we do it at a very nominal cost of uh, 499 rupees, 999 rupees. And then some of the courses are absolutely free, right? So there is a, a certain charge that we do is so that, you know, uh, some companies that charge lakhs of rupees. We don't do that. We make it free. We make it accessible to all. We want to democratize quantum education and make sure that it reaches into the hands of every person in each and every remote corner of the world. So I'll quickly share my screen and tell you how you can actually learn quantum computing very easily. So this is the app that we have. I'll also share audio with you with the interest of time. I'll quickly go through it and show you the brief videos that we have out there. So this is our application. You can go ahead and download the application. It's called Qubit Pro. It's available on Play Store now. So it's the only application in the whole quantum industry and the only mobile application. It allows you to learn quantum computing easily. Then I'm also going to take you through what exactly are we going to cover uh, videos, right? I hope you can hear the audio. Yes, sir. Yes. Welcome to the world of quantum computing. Silicofella Quantum Academy is a quantum computing company that offers comprehensive and accessible quantum computing courses using the Qubit Pro app. With a deep commitment to demystifying quantum computing and making it accessible to all, Silicofella Quantum Academy aims to empower individuals and organizations with the knowledge and skills necessary to harness the transformative potential of quantum technologies. In this comprehensive course, you will gain a deep understanding of quantum computing and its practical applications using Qubit Pro app. By the end of this course, you will be equipped with the skills to harness the power of quantum computers and unlock its potential in solving complex problems using the Qubit Pro app. Throughout the course, you will explore essential topics such as essential maths for quantum computing, postulates of quantum mechanics, qubits and block spheres, tensor products, multi-qubit gates, analyzing quantum circuits, 
quantum teleportation and quantum entanglement. We'll dive into each topic providing clear explanations and hands-on exercises to ensure your comprehensive understanding. This course is designed for engineers, scientists and curious minds who want to delve into the fascinating world of quantum computing. Whether you're a professional looking to enhance your skills or a passionate learner eager to explore new horizons, this course is for you. Enroll now and explore the extraordinary possibilities of quantum computing by getting access to Qubit Pro app. Enroll today or watch our free preview to embark on this transformative journey of quantum computing. So apart from that, we have also done a podcast with the IBM Quantum India lead. I will suggest you to go through it. It is available exclusively on the Qubit Pro app. So this is just a small clip of it, but the rest of it is available on the Qubit Pro app. So just download that application and, you know, learn from what he has to say about the quantum computing in India, what actually is happening in India currently. Apart from that, uh, we also have this... Uh, as I said, we'll dive deeper into the quantum, uh, quantum, Hi. right? So we, we have taken our Today I'm going of to... teaching on blackboards and whiteboards. We've taught it in a very comprehensive way using, uh, whiteboard. So you can see how extensively uh, all the concepts are covered. So as I know, we cannot do no. it in two hours. So we have about 24 hours of material that is readily available for you to go ahead and start learning quantum computing. So with that, I would like to conclude the session and I would like to thank the, uh, you know, VIT, uh, VIT Chennai for giving me this opportunity to present. It's been a very interactive session and I've uh, taken the time out to present to you all guys because I am very active and I want to uh, make sure that it reaches into the hands of uh, people in every single college. So with that, if anybody has any questions, uh, you know, just feel free to ask me. Participant, any questions? Yes. Sir, what do you expect from academic uh, institutions? How uh, how do you see? So you are being industrial person. Uh, uh, yes. Naturally, naturally, as an academic person, we would like to push our students to uh, industry. And uh, what is your expectation? What is your expectation in uh, research aspect also? If anything so, you have in mind, just... Yes. In research aspect, we need to be very hands-on with quantum computing firstly. So there has to be a lot of uh, circuits that you implemented on quantum computing. Only then we'll see a person fit, you know, in the industry that is the norm that you should have a very hands-on experience. So if somebody has executed a lot of circuits, they've contributed to Qiskit programming and done research on it. So then they, they have the chances of getting the job very easily. And apart from that, the research institute should definitely, uh, you know, focus on teaching as many people as possible, trying to integrate it with the curriculum, not just uh, a small course on quantum computing, but essentially a course on a specialized course for the BTEC students, right? BTEC in quantum computing, not just uh, normal computing. And then our BTEC with computer science and specialization in quantum computing. Then also a master's on quantum computing. So currently there's a couple of institutes like ISC and IST that offer a master's on quantum computing. That is where the companies actually come for placement and try to recruit students. So that is why we need a set subjects, I think 20, 30 uh, subjects that we need to teach in order to make them, uh, you know, hands-on with quantum computing. Sir, you mentioned 20 to 30 subjects. Yes, correct. Oh, sir, can you na na name a few? Uh, yeah, sir, we, we, we are thinking just that uh, quantum computation and quantum drug discovery, something like that. But 20 to 30 topics means uh, a bit, it's, it's uh, very surprising. So can you just mention a few? So that is for the master's degree I'm referring to, uh, which will have a one-year uh, project and one year for learning. Out of that, there will be two semesters. So some students can, out of the 30, they can take around 10 to 12. And some of them will be quantum optics, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum photonics, quantum hardware, quantum applications, quantum for cybersecurity, quantum uh, programming. All these, all these topics are there, which you know people need to have a, a, a thorough understanding. 
okay okay quantum right. chemistry as well as you said the discovery and all those things Thank you. Thank you. There are there, there are readily available syllabuses out there. I would be happy to share them with you so you can have a look at them. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Anyone, uh, any final comments? Uh, Christopher, sir, are you there? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, we are connected. I think uh, Sarvesh can have some questions. So, uh, yeah. Sarvesh. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. So. So, like you said, you'd be manufacturing the quantum chips, right? So, so how do you get resources here? Because, like, chip-wise, even for classical computers, India is way lagging in uh, just the silicon chips itself. Now only we started silicon manufacturing. But then with quantum computer chips manufacturing, it will become, it is actually a hectic task. So, how are you managing that? Uh, so, we are actively managing that. Uh, in terms of resources, right? So we are incubated by NASCOM, uh, uh, which is uh, the premier uh, government body for IT sector. And we are also incubated by the Data Security Council of India and the National Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity and Entrepreneurship, which is an initiative by the Ministry of Electronics. So that is why we are getting a lot of support from the government uh, to you know push us through our agenda. And we have seen a lot of progress also happening in this space. So very soon you'll also hear an exciting announcement. So stay tuned from us. I think on 15th of December, there's going to be a, a big announcement that might come up. So just uh, tune in and you know you can learn more about what is happening in our company so far. So it's going to be a huge milestone for us. And then second question, what was your second question? Uh, yeah, um, this thing. Uh... How are you, man? Like now in the, how, uh, how far lag behind are we, are Indians? Oh, in, yeah. in... So that is something I, I'll give you a short example of uh, when Corona happened, right? So people said that India cannot make their own vaccines. They cannot, uh, you know, we cannot become a hub for uh, developing our own vaccines. We had never done it. So similarly in semiconductors, people also have the same, uh, you know, they say the same things, but uh, we all, we have the necessary capability to do that we have the brilliant scientists in India are there brilliant researchers are there so it's only a matter of time where we start pushing things so we can you know indigenize uh, quantum chips quantum computers everything can be made in India okay so and one, one more thing so there is this notion of uh, using analog chips for uh, quantum computing right so yeah. uh, in the market so what do you think is the way forward is it going to be um, the vacuum tube based chips or the so we are know, using superconducting chips. So we believe that superconducting is going to be the best way to do it. IBM also does that. Google also does that. And uh, Rigetti also does that. So we believe that I, uh, you know, there's also a race between different modalities of quantum computing. Some say iron trap is the best way. So some believe superconducting is the same way. So there's no clear winner yet who's going to be, uh, you know, the, the winner in the end. Okay. And, and one more thing um, regarding the photonics, like, how, like, is there any chip that uses light for uh, computing in quantum computers? Uh, yes, the photonic chips uh, do use the lights. Uh, squeezers are there, entanglers are there. So they are actually beaming photons inside the chip and then measuring those chips. Uh, so that is happening with photonics. Okay, do, do they have the same kind of uh, architecture like the, like with software in, 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 its, in terms of software, is the architecture same for even the photonics or... Will it be a little different? So, it's a different. It's a little different if you if you want to dive deeper into it. So, Penny Lane is the right programming language. Just write it down. Penny Lane, P E N N Y L A N E, which is developed by Xanadu. Xanadu does photonics, quantum computing, and they have their own programming language to uh, you know uh, operate. Okay, in terms of uh, efficiency, which one do you think is best, uh, superconducting or photonic-based uh, chips? In, in terms of uh, the efficiency, I think superconducting is, is the best one, right? So photonics is obviously on room temperatures. So there's a lot of... So every, every different modality has their own benefits and advantages, uh, disadvantages. So in, su in superconducting, the disadvantage, li uh, the advantage lies in gate times. So the speed, the, the speed at which the calculations happens are very fast. So similarly in iron, iron trap, the, that speed is very less. So out of those two, I would definitely suggest uh, that 
superconducting is the way forward and you can look into it uh, you know try to figure out what are the advantages and disadvantages of both of them okay okay thank you thank you for clarifying thing my pleasure thank you so much any other questions any other questions sir what was the date which you are referring to uh, uh, the uh, 15th of december about a week okay i think uh, sir have... uh, can you yeah. tell me the uh, commonly used quantum algorithm uh, which can be used at the very best uh, so we discussed quantum teleportation was we were discussing but we couldn't continue then we have super dense coding we have the bernstein wazirani algorithm shores algorithm is one of the most prominent grover's algorithm is very prominent so all these algorithms are you know the basic uh, what do we call them so there is not many algorithms to be honest there is only about 10 algorithms if i'll name them down so that's all you need to learn in terms of the algorithm side okay sir thank you excuse me sir again uh, this is the last that i have well have uh, like so what is a career path how if I, if one person asked if a student has to join your company what do you suggest for them to develop themselves to join your company or get recruited by your company so they need to have the projects in quantum computing that is all so first requirement is that they need to be uh, having a masters degree or they need to have the ibm certification or they need to have a phd in quantum computing so these three are the, the basic criteria then uh, to differentiate somebody we need to look at the projects that they have executed the work that they have done on quantum computers how many qubit quantum computers have they operated so somebody might say that i am no quantum computing but he hasn't even operated uh, on a 10 qubit quantum computer also right so that would be a red flag so similarly we look at the hands on experience that a person has that's all okay thank you sir any other question i think uh, sir you have answered all the queries of the participant yes yeah so i'll take this uh, uh, moment to uh, extend our sincere thanks to mr manan narang uh, for uh, sharing his uh, insights on uh, the quantum computing uh, um, mr manan covered all the um, Uh, topics right from the basics of uh, quantum computing and uh, um, you extensively uh, i think help the participant to understand the uh, the bracket notation which is essential for understanding the research papers on quantum computing i think that would be uh, very useful for uh, researchers and other uh, students who want to explore in uh, you know in this uh, space of quantum computing and i also uh, have to uh, congratulate you for um, you know uh, creating a a first of a form of uh, you know uh, app cubit pro i think um, our cells the coordinators as well as the participant will give it a try and uh, to know the features of uh, that uh, app and also uh, we extend your uh, you know uh, heartfelt thanks to you for uh, uh, you know sharing some insights on various uh, topics like uh, you know new topics like uh, Uh, how uh, no, optics can be used in quantum computing on various disciplines where uh, they can actually use uh, this particular uh, concept of uh, no uh, by uh, no quantum mechanics uh, thank you sir thank you for sharing all your experiences yes thank you so much for the opportunity once again it was a pleasure to be here if you guys have you know want to take up the discussion forward so again on next saturday uh, we are meeting so there is a quantum community that we have inside the qubit pro app and every week we have discussions so anybody can come up from any any point of uh, you know their uh, stage in quantum computing a beginner to an expert and they can join the discussion so that is very interesting for people to come in and share their thoughts on quantum computing so all you need to do is download the qubit pro app and become a member right after you become a member you firstly get access to about 24 hours of learning material that is there about two courses are there on quantum computing one is the introduction to quantum mechanics and the other one is about qiskit so these courses you get absolutely for free 
as you become a member. So just become a member, be a part of the community and, you know, uh, tell other people also so they can also learn about quantum computing. That is one of the main things that people are not aware also, right? So tell your friends. We also provide referrals. So whenever you tell your friend, you give your referral code to your friend. So you get 500 qubit coins and you can use those qubit coins to become a member. And the membership cost is only 9.99 for a month. So in 9.99, you're getting so much benefits that are out there. And if you also don't want to spend that, you can just sign up for the free courses. So, so that is something that I would recommend to you all that, you know, this is just one small step in your journey. And I really, really thank you for taking the first step. Sometimes that is all that matters. But learning quantum computing sometimes can be tough. And if we all learn together, right, we can answer all each other questions also. So it becomes very, very easier for you to, uh, you know, start into quantum computing. Thank you so much, everybody, for being a wonderful audience. And thank you so much to VIT uh, Chennai for giving me this opportunity to present and share my thoughts on quantum computing. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thanks for your grateful and uh, great session. And you interact so many things and your uh, thoughts on the quantum computing and you gave so many information for the future reference also. And definitely we will uh, uh, up, uh, that is download your uh, app and we will utilize what the things you are uh, provided uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And thank this you, is, thank uh, you, sir. Take care. Uh, yeah, unforgettable one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Yeah, Palani sir, shall we move for the concluding session? Yes, sir.